Hello, and welcome to Industry Night with me, Nikki Nellis, the show that takes you on a deep dive into the happenings of the hospitality industry. Now, sometimes there's a focus on culture, and sometimes there's a focus on travel trends, and sometimes there's a focus on passion projects, but it all comes back to the industry. Now, for those of you who've been new here, welcome. Thanks so much for joining me here on Industry Night. A little background on me. I've been covering the food, wine, and hospitality scene for the last 20 years, uh, primarily in D.C., but I do get abroad and I do get across the country every now and then. Uh, you certainly read the list, areyouonit.com, the online e-zine that tells you about everything happening in the D.C. metro area. Um, you follow me at N-Y-C-C-I, N-E-L-L-I-S, on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter for the moment, uh, for all the happenings around town and some of my fabulous tra travels. Um, and you tune in every Sunday to hear me and my husband, David, on Foodie and the Beast, the only food and wine radio here in D.C., and we've been doing it for 14 years. We have everybody on that show. And lucky me, I have this podcast industry night now in the 17th year, oh, seventh year, sorry, seven years. Um, and I'm so fortunate because I get to do it here at this gorgeous wine lair. Now, last week, the private club wine lair, I usually do it here in their private dining room, which is gorgeous. You can see all the bottles behind me. But last week we did it in the cellar. And that was pretty fabulous because I was surrounded by amazing, amazing wines. But let's be honest. It was chilly. So um, as much as I like being in there, I'm really glad to be here with my like cup of tea and being really warm and surrounded by uh, wine bottles and the horns from the Ritz-Carlton Hotel behind me. So let's talk about what's been happening in and around town, shall we? Let's be honest, getting back into the thick of things after the holidays is a grind. I mean, everybody is just so slow. Nobody wants to do anything. But we all got to get back to it. So I wasn't out and about as much as I normally am the last week, but I certainly did hit a couple places that you need to check out. So Le Diplomat, I know it's not new, but boy, is it an area favorite, man. Always hopping. And I didn't go just once this week. I went twice. I went once for lunch, which was delicious. And I went once for brunch. And if you have not been to Le Diplomat for brunch, you are totally missing one of the seniest hottest places for brunch in the city. And the food is really, really delicious. I mean, it's French brasserie and Stephen Starr knows how to do it right. Um, okay, the RAMW holiday party was on Monday night. It was at the Mayflower Club and it was sexy, like really cool people, really great drinks, incredible food. I know you don't expect great food at a nightclub, but the Mayflower Club is doing something really different. It's like four floors. There's music, different music and different things happening on every floor. Um, I'm really going to get my girls like to go out one night and go dancing. And yes, I'm in my 50s, but um, this girl's going dancing and I'm going to Mayflower Club. But the party was really to um, cure on the industry, which of course needs it. But also to welcome Sean Townsend, who's the new executive director now that Kathy Hollinger has moved on. And we will be having Sean on the show very shortly to talk about him taking over the reins from Kathy. Um, I just popped into an oldie but a goodie. I popped into um, Iron Gate, Anthony Chittam's restaurant over in DuPont Circle. It's so sweet and so cute. So the front is a bar that you can hang out and have dishes in. And then there's this massive courtyard that you can also hang out and have dishes in. But then there's the little gem in the back. So it's this little room with a fireplace and the kitchen. It seats about 30 people. And if you want a romantic spot in DC, this is definitely it. And Tony Chenum is still knocking out some amazing food. Okay, so that's just a peek into my whining and dining. Uh, and if you want to stay up to date on all the things I'm doing, you do want to follow me on Instagram. I am doing reels, even though I really hate it, but I'm still doing it. Um, but I do take amazing photos of all the food uh, that I eat. Years and years of eating well has taught me how to get some good angles. Um, but anyway, so you can check it all out there. And if you want to see all the restaurant openings that have happened, because there's been some amazing ones, Bronze, the restaurant that is sort of serving this um, cuisine from the African diaspora, 
incredible things. It just opened last week. Uh, the Bolivian bar uh, Casa Cantuta just opened last week. And a French Canadian disco, it's serving poutine. Le Mont Royale has also opened, and that's in Adams Morgan. So all the new openings are on the list, areyouwanna.com. Every cocktail and mocktail you want to try for January is there as well. And believe it or not, we're moving fast into this year. Lunar uh, New Year celebrations, you got to get your rabbit on. Fat Tuesday recommendations. And before you know it, Valentine's Day is going to be here. So whether you like it or not, you're going to have to find a way to show your love to somebody. Okay, I think, I think we've hit most of it. So let's get on to today's show. So, etiquette. Emily Post has been America's go-to source for etiquette and manners um, for like the last hundred years. And Emily Post, how she started and how her legacy continues is such a rich, rich history because it's all rooted in things that we should know and do know but don't always act on, which is being considerate and being respectful. I mean, it sounds so easy. But I think when people hear the word etiquette, they think elite they think you have to have money to know etiquette. Um, but etiquette is for everyone. Um, and it's really about meeting people where they are. Um, so, And that's exactly what Emily Post's classic guide is about. And the latest version has been completely rewrit rewritten and up to date. And it's a total comprehensive advice book. And with me today is the author and great, great granddaughter of Emily Post, Lizzie Post. Now, Lizzie and I met a couple weeks ago at an event. She was there talking about her book. We were at um, we we're at the Greenhouse Restaurant uh, and just had such a wonderful conversation. I thought, these are such amazing things that people really need to know. So I'm so excited because um, Lizzie is keeping this tradition alive. Thanks so much for joining me today. Thank you so much for having me, Nikki. I had such a great time meeting you at the Jefferson event. It was amazing. And I I was so grateful for the time that we got to talk with one another. And I loved your enthusiasm for this topic and for the idea of really breaking down barriers. So I was, I was thrilled to be here. <laughs> I'm so thrilled to hear that. So let's talk about let's give a little background. I mean, I can't imagine somebody hasn't heard about Emily Post or Etiquette. But <laughs> Let's start there, because I mean, your great great grandmother's story is really interesting. It is. Emily uh, was born in the Gilded Age. She is a daughter of the Gilded Age. Um, for those of you that watched the HBO series, Emily would have been probably about 10 or 13 at the time um, that that show is set. And she was really, you know, expected to grow up and become a wife and mother and uh, a lady of the house in all of those wonderful, uh, expensive ways that a lady of the house exists. Um, running staff, uh, throwing parties, furthering her husband's business through these social connections. And Emily did do all those things. She, she got married. She, she played that role of the supportive wife. And at the same time, her marriage ended up crumbling and she got divorced. What was really surprising was that she never remarried. Many women did get divorced during that time. Many men got divorced too. Can we just, I know, but can we just start there? It's so interesting. I think we live in a time period where we really think that people didn't get divorced, you know, I know. Years ago, which is silly, but it is yeah. amazing that she mm -hmm. did. It is. It's I think. And the, the more amazing thing is the not getting remarried because you're right. It's it's something that we assume. Oh, back in the day, everyone got married and stayed married. But really, there was a lot of divorcing going on. And what was uncommon was to have a woman who didn't then get remarried, especially a woman of society, a woman of New York's 400. Um, it really wasn't the kind of thing that was typical. Even more radical was the fact that Emily, in order to support herself, had taken up writing as a career. She was writing basically romance novels. Um, she did one book that was a cross-country trip. It's called By Motor to the Golden Gate, and it was done okay. in uh, 20, or, sorry, 1916. And she and I believe her son, who acted as kind of like a chauffeur and mechanic, and her cousin, who acted as a secretary, uh, drove across the country together and chronicled the trip. Uh, for a magazine and it was then turned into a book. But that was kind of her writing experience. 
And then she kind of got the idea that writing about etiquette might be a really good thing to do and something that really worked for her, especially after having traveled around the country and seeing that, boy, not everybody lives the way they live in New York, you know? Um, and so she ended up putting together this book and uh, it became an instant bestseller. Etiquette was released in 1922 as a first edition and it just hit the mark. It kind of pulled back a lot of the mystery on how the upper crust entertained and how um, people in New York society lived and behaved and interacted with one another. At the same time, Emily had done some work towards thinking about the everyday person, the person who doesn't have, have you know, <laughs> tons of staff. <laughs> I, exactly. I know that in her, um, in her first edition, 1922, she, there's a moment where she's talking about the tea tray and how you'd set up a tea tray and bring it out. And she talks about the fact that, you know, even if you don't have a silver tea tray and a butler to present it, you know, a humbled hostess with, you know, uh, the, the cleanest of tea towels and a simple tray will be the most hospitable. You know, it, like she really put this emphasis on the idea that it is so much more etiquette is so much more about how we treat one another than the money or the class or the education that we have. And I think that set her in good stead as she then updated the book every five years to continually make it more inclusive, continually make it um, more accessible to people. And she got both a lot of requests to do that. And she found she enjoyed doing the project more that way. Um, well, so, I'm sort of curious about that because yeah. you know, when you think of the change in this country over the last hundred years, you know, culturally, um, it is interesting that people are like, no, this is what we want. We want it. We want it too, but we we want it for us. You know, we can't. Yes. We don't have a staff, and we don't have a silver, you know, tea service. Um, so you know what I mean? Like, I, do, I think it's yeah. really interesting. Like, how was she able? How was she able to do that? How was she able to make people, because it, since it's etiquette, how yeah. was she able to make people feel comfortable when it, so, it feels unnatural? I think that's such a great question. Number one, Emily grew up with parents who I think did a really good job of of showing the idea that not embarrassing people making others feel welcomed and supported was a way to be gracious so i think she had this really good foundation just in her own upbringing she kind of lucked out but then beyond that she wasn't afraid to kind of um grab the rules and take the reins with them in some ways she was one of the first people to talk about abandoning the Victorian style of dining where you would set out all of your dining pieces. So even if a, a meal didn't require certain implements, you would still set them out because they were beautiful. It was a way of showing everything you had, of providing absolutely everything that might even be needed. And Emily really helped us consolidate it. And, and we can credit her with having said that you should really only have about three courses worth of utensils on the table at a time. And so I, but I look at that as ballsy. I mean, right. that was like, you know, who is she? What is she? Who, you know, it was a really fascinating to me that that was a part of it. So in some ways it was about being willing to step outside and move things forward. In other ways, it was about paying attention to things, um, ways she had seen people be gracious and applying those. So kind of like you think about the best people that you know, and if you imagine trying to act like them or trying to tell somebody how they act, how they behave, I think she did a lot of that. But she also did a lot of listening, Nikki. She was famous for doing qualitative research where she would talk to her cab driver. She would talk to the doorman. She would talk to the um, subway ticket holder. She would talk to the clerk at the store and she would get a lot of perspectives. She actually really cared about gathering the perspectives around her to help figure out what the best thing to do might be so that you're not ignoring people. And well, I just think that that was a part of her tradition. Yeah, well, I think what's interesting about that, because you and I had talked about that, is that I think people would think Emily Post would be, haughty is the wrong word, but would be oh, like- Oh, it's a good word though. Instructive. <laughs> so if she yes. was talking to the doorman, right. for example, she yeah. would be instructive 
instead of listening and being like, okay, so this gentleman and his wife, you know, they should do it like this. But really what she heard was is where they were and how they could do it. And that's what I think, that's where I think etiquette gets lost. I in agree. The, in the, I mean, you said it before, but it's really just about being kind and thoughtful, right? <laughs> it does. It does boil down to that. At, at Emily Post, um, the Institute, we teach a lot of business etiquette seminars and things like that. And one of the ways that we talk about the concept of etiquette is an etiquette equation. And we say that etiquette is really made up of manners and principles. And the principles we identify as consideration, respect, and honesty. And when you guide um, when you guide yourself using those three principles, sort of no matter what the situation is, you, you're going to be in good stead. And even if you get something wrong, you could apologize for it. But the manners are really interesting because they change over time. They're very, um, uh, very connected to a, a point in time and a different era. They're connected to uh, different cultures and sometimes even friend groups or family situations, right? What you do at your dinner table might not be the same dinner practice at the house next door to you. And I love the idea that manners, while they are they are things that are expected of us and that we can expect from others, like a, a handshake, um, that they change over time. And that we, as a culture, we the people who represent a culture or a country or an area even, end up really driving that more than any one person like an Emily Post. And I always thought Emily was really smart to kind of treat her career in the fashion that she was like a, a barometer for North American ev etiquette instead of a dictator of it, instead of saying, this is how it was, so this is how it should be. She says, well, how are we living? What's working? What isn't working? And let's talk about that. Well, I'd love to talk about 100 years later, uh, your great-great-grandmother is long gone. Um, so how <laughs> did stay in the family business? How did we get 100 years later, you you writing this book, you did it with yeah. your, your cousin, cousin. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Our great, great grandson, which I mean, yeah. it's just so amazing. So how did it stay in the family business? So Emily actually had a bit of an agenda. She, when etiquette took off and became such a big hit, and, and when I say it became such a big hit, it was a national bestseller. She had a national radio program for years that was one of the top radio programs. I mean, she really people glommed on to this advice and ran with it. Um, and she really did have a, a bestseller for years and years and years. And she really felt that she wanted it to stay within her family. And so in 1946, she founded the Emily Post Institute. Her son at that point had, had come on board to help her manage. I mean, she was getting huge amounts of fan mail. She had spokesperson deals. She had this radio show that she managed and there was the publication. So there was a lot to manage. And he kind of came on, especially as she was aging and helped her do that. And when it came time for uh, the business to actually pass on to someone else, he was really ready to retire. But his son and his son's wife, uh, so my grandparents, they were um, in a position where their kids were old enough that, and they kind of looked at the material that could be ghostwritten for it. And very classic, my grandmother, she looked at it and said, I could do a better job. And someone said to her, okay, you should try then. And that's how she ended up taking on the mantle. And then that generation kind of just, when they were ready to retire, handed it to the next generation. And um, my parents' generation was the first to actually try doing more than one person representing the name. And that was really interesting because as they started to approach their 50s and 60s, and my generation was coming out of college, it made they the experience of just having the, the business handed right off made them decide they'd like to bring younger posts into the fold, have them work within the family business for a number of years, and then be able to take it over to really see whether they wanted to be in it, to understand what it's really like. So in terms of just how it went from generation to generation, in some ways it was very organic. There was still just this book that was selling really well and this concept that people really liked. And eventually it became much more of a, you know, a content company in, in the modern world. 
Well, you mentioned um, the Institute. So what does the Institute do? It's more than just the book. It's true. We are more than just the book. I wish I could say that we were like this big, beautiful colonial building with tons of people typing oh, answers to etiquette right. questions all day. But, the tea set all set up is what I'm thinking. Yeah, I wish, I wish, I wish. And I wish the butlers came out at four with the tea and everything. But um, we are, uh, we're a small family business. Um, right now, at one point we were a 12 person business. We manage an entire series of um, training and uh, uh, seminar services. So we'll either train you to teach Emily Post etiquette in business or children's categories. Um, we also will just come to your company or your organization and talk about different topics of etiquette. Um, and then we do programs for individuals. So e-learning, audio series, tip a day type series, things like that. We also manage all of our publications still. We have uh, a, at this point well over 25 book collection. Um, that ranges from toddler books all the way through to this new beautiful 100th anniversary edition that we have out. Um, and then we have a really robust podcast that I am very proud to say has been going for over eight years with not a single rerun, break, pause. There are no seasons. I, I know you can appreciate what that's like <laughs> weekly. So, um, but those are sort of the branches. And then of course we do, we have a website and social media and all of that. So that's what the Institute is. The thing that we really want to advance towards is doing a lot more research. We would love to have a lot more studies being done, um, and thing and participate more sort of in a in a in an academic way towards the idea of etiquette it's it's a topic that's so closely tied to sociology and there's actually a sociologist who's studying emily post etiquette right now she's got all 20 editions and she's put them into a searchable database and she's found some really interesting things over the years but um, it would be nice to, to be able in the future hopefully uh, to expand into that kind of more research driven category well, you know, you sort of talked about your great great grandmother and, you know, setting the table. And, you know, we think of these sort of entertaining as etiquette. Yeah. But there's been so much change to that. So I'd love to talk. Let's start about it. Let's start with entertaining okay. and entertaining etiquette today. But then let's get into some of the other changes that are yeah. out there where <laughs> etiquette is so important. But let's talk about being a great host. Mm -hmm. And also being a great guest, because you could be an amazing host, but if your guest is a jerk, your guest is a jerk. It makes it hard. <laughs> so, do. How do you, what are some of your recommendations for being, or what's in the book updated now, not in the Gilded Age, but in our current age of right. how to be a terrific host? I think what's really nice about the 2022 version of this book <laughs> is that um, being a great host really is about, cre I mean, it, it was in Emily's day, but I think now so even more that it's really about creating a welcoming and comfortable atmosphere for your guests. And what I love about this brand and, and this tradition in my family is that Emily, for all the amazing descriptions of detailed formal dining from her era that was like just unbelievable Gatsby-like stuff, she talks about how the simple dinner for four friends in the kitchen with maybe a game of bridge played afterwards is probably the most delightful. And gosh, if that just doesn't put you at ease and think about your Friday night pizza night with your friends who have kids your age or something like that. And, you know, you get together casually, but you really enjoy it. I feel like that's the modern day version of her bridge night, you know. Um, but what I love is that entertaining is one of those things that when your foundation is about making people feel comfortable, it doesn't really change that much over time. But there are some things that factor in that might change. Um Things like, for instance, a lot of us now have uh, door cameras and security or maybe even a smart speaker in our home. And these are things that we want to be aware of because they're new technologies. They're new to our way of living. And newness is a place where we tend to have little etiquette hiccups moments where we don't let someone know that there's a security camera, <laughs> you know, <laughs> that's going to see, you know, that I'll be able to see you when you come to the door or something like that. 
Um, or if we, uh, I, my favorite story is one of someone who forgot to shut their um, smart speaker reminders off. And so like in the middle of dessert, it ends up blaring out the positive affirmations that this person has been doing for weeks. Like, you're great and you're really going to be able to make it happen. Like, you know. <laughs> So it's kind of funny, but managing the things around us is a big a big part of what a host has to do in terms of preparing their home. But I think also a, a traditional thing, something hosts have always had to do that's really important is leading our guests. We are the ringleader. We are the ones in charge of the evening, the event, the afternoon, the brunch, whatever it is. And as the host, I think we got to give people confidence to be that ringleader, to be that good guide, that it's okay for you to have an agenda for your party. If there's entertaining and food, you're the one who's going to suggest when the entertainment begins and when it's time to transition to eating or vice versa. And it's really important to feel confident about that. Like we all have different homes. We all have different budgets. But most of the time when we invite someone over, we're trying to make them feel comfortable. So that means our house needs to be clean and presentable. We are trying to make sure they are taken care of. So we want to make sure we have some kind of food and some kind of beverage to offer. And then we're just in after that, after those two things are taken care of, really, it's up to you how the rest of things unfold, whether, like we said, there's some kind of big entertainment going on or whether or not this is just a casual conversation kind of event, that sort of thing. But, but really making people feel comfortable in your space and providing them something to eat and drink are like the basic basics of hosting. Well, I don't disagree with that. I mean, I'm running through like hosting in my head and the things yeah. that I do. And yeah. I think, you know, for people like me in the hospitality industry, yeah. you know, there's a certain level, there's a certain standard that I want. And yes. I think so important for me um, is that when, when my guests do arrive, that all that stress and all that anxiety, because no matter how solid my menu is, no matter how timely I am, what, like whether or not like I have 10 minutes before they come to the door, there's that, you know, it's, it can be anxiety filled to have people to your home and to entertain. Yeah. Um, so is letting it go. So that when my guests do come in, whether it's my parents, you know, people I'll be yeah. close to or like business guests, that I it's it's gone. Do you know what I mean? And letting I that do. go. It's not always easy. But no. like, that to me <laughs> is so important. Now let's talk about the reverse. Sure. Being a good guest. What is it that the guest should bring to the table? I think the guest number one needs to bring. Or actually, person. in my house, the guest should bring nothing to the table. I don't <laughs> like. I do not like if somebody says, "What can I bring?" and I say, "Please, don't nothing. bring anything," and yeah. they come with a dessert or they come with a dish, and I'm like, "I'm no, I'm not putting it out. I'm sorry, that's not fair." <laughs> I know that's not nice, but like, don't do it. Still, I agree. I'm, I'm with you on that. If, if I'm trying to treat everyone to an evening, I don't want extra stuff showing up or and as the host, you also if that's the, the nature of the evening, if you said don't bring anything and they bring something, you are not obligated to serve that something. Thank you. Thank you. you are most welcome. <laughs> um, but as a host or as a guest, excuse me, the very first responsibility that we have is to RSVP and to actually let our host know whether we're going to come to their event or not. Someone has just issued you an invitation. That shouldn't be a chore. That shouldn't Agreed. be a groan. That should be, wow, I'm, I'm really grateful to receive this. Whether or not you decide to attend is totally different, but each invitation should be treated with respect and given the respect that it deserves. And so responding quickly, um, if you do have to check with a partner, check a calendar, wait until you get notice about some other event that you've already been told about, like that's fine, but let your host know. And then the two of you can either come up with a date that you'll let them know by, or there will be an RSVP date that you have to let your host know by. And it's really important that we don't lose sight of this RSVP. Beyond I agree that, with you. There is, there's nothing worse than calling somebody and being like, you coming? Are you coming? What's <laughs> happening? You know, yeah. I'm with you. I think that makes a lot of sense. Go ahead. I, I, that's a courtesy that I really hope this, that like my generation and the one below me don't lose sight of. I think it's actually a really good you're one. Good. I'm Gen X. What are you? I'm millennial. And so 
It's and like I'm the early side of millennial. So like just the end of Gen X. But because I'm 82, I'm really not Gen X. <laughs> I don't count. I'm millennial. <laughs> um, but I do think it's so it's so important that we not just flake out, that we not treat invitations as casual. But in, I mean, there are lots of casual invitations out there, but I think it's really important to really treat each invitation with a lot of respect and, and be honored that people are inviting you to do things. Um, Beyond that, I think it's really important that we communicate well as guests. So in that RSVP, if there is something like a food allergy or a pet allergy or something like that, checking in about whether or not you should bring a dish or whether or not you can even attend in some cases. I mean, for folks who, for instance, uh, keep kosher, that's actually something that can be very, uh, you know, something that could prevent you from dining at someone else's home, depending on how their kitchen is kept. And so this RSVP. This is the time where we do a little host guest dance back and forth. Yeah, kind of show up. And I'll be honest with you, Liz. Um, I also would say to people, not just in the home, but at a restaurant. So if you're going to a restaurant and you're vegan, you know, and you sh and they don't have vegan dishes, you know, you should call them and ask if they're, you know, they make vegan dishes. Or if you're kosher, you should find out, can you serve fish to me on a paper plate? I mean, you know, I believe that the guest, whether it's in a home or in a restaurant or you go to a wedding, whatever it is, it is up to them to let you know what, you know, or like my sister's kids have peanut allergies and my sister is, she's great, but she's a nut about those peanut allergies. But she calls before, she tells people, you know, she lets people know so that, that that she's comfortable, but that also they know. And I think you have to be an advocate, right? I think so too. I think it's really, really important. And I think just switching back to host mode for a moment, one of the best things a host can do is in that RSVP moment, ask, are there any oh, allergies that you have? Do you need any accessible, you know, is there anything that would make my home more accessible to you? That's one we forget mm -hmm. to ask a lot about. Not everyone has the same mobility. So mm -hmm. it's important to ask these questions. It's important to think about them. And that RSVP moment, it's okay for guests to bring it up if a host hasn't asked. I'm mm -hmm. with you. I think it's really important that guests bring these things up. Don't think that you are a burden by bringing this up. No, 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 no. There is so no burden. <laughs> yeah, it's you are invited. You are welcomed. And I take you as you are. Like I'm not, <laughs> you know what I mean? It really, it should have that kind of feel to it. But the other thing, once we've moved past the RSVP, showing up on time, I think is really important as best we can. Obviously something that's an open house, you've got some wiggle room, but on sure. time is within 20 minutes. Sorry, go ahead. I like, I like people who are five minutes late. Five minutes. <laughs> totally. Give me five minutes. <laughs> Give me that extra five minutes. But this is one where people don't realize when it comes to socializing, as opposed to in business, where we often say show up early, do mm -hmm. not show up early to social events. Your mm -hmm. host has timed everything. Most hosts usually run a tiny bit late. And yep. so the idea of showing up 15 minutes early to a social event at someone's home, the likelihood is they're not quite ready and that you're going to now make them have to start entertaining you before they were ready to do so. So take a mm -hmm. walk around the block, go grab a coffee, sit on yep. your phone and read something. Yeah. Right. Just wait till the start of the party <laughs> well, so now you brought up business etiquette let's yeah. talk about that a little bit what how does it differ from what we do at home what are some of the recommendations you make to people whether it's in a business interview or when they're doing something social for business what are some of the things these pearls of wisdom that you uh, train people on so we talk a lot about in, in business etiquette. It's funny, business is not a one size fits all thing. Some industries, for instance, like fashion industry, what's going to be appropriate to wear to work if you work in fashion is so different than if you work in a very conservative law firm, like just totally different. And so we often really talk to people about the idea of knowing your industry within your industry, know your company, know what's expected of you. Are there rules? Are there expectations? You should be meeting them if there are. Um, within that, we try really hard not to stifle individuals. So like we don't say you have to wear pantyhose and makeup if you identify as a woman. 
Like it's, we don't even say that you have to brush your hair. We talk about it being managed because not all hair can be brushed. You know, it's really important to understand uh, from a perspective of personal appearance and how we're going to present ourselves that we want to present the best version of our authentic selves. And I think that that's something I'm really happy that Emily Post has gravitated towards over the years, rather than saying one size fits all, this is what you should look like. This is the only thing in professional, and I'm using air quotes, you know, environments. So I think it's really important um, when we're talking about business to, to be aware of ourselves, be aware of what we want to be presenting and actually what we might be presenting. Um, you can't necessarily control someone's impression of you, but you can control a lot of things that help build that impression. And so I, you know, it's like at the end of the day, I can put it all together. And if you still don't like me, that's one thing. But if I'm at least put together in a way where you can keep the focus on my ideas, my skills, um, and a little bit of my personality, I think we're going to be doing really well. So a lot of our business advice focuses on self-reflection and awareness of the perception of others. Well, I think that's really important. And uh, again, I think that probably straddles both, you know, your day-to-day -day life as well as your professional yes. life, right? Very much so. Well, very much so. so. Let's talk about a couple of other things because you gave me a bunch of notes here and there's so many things <laughs> I want to talk about. Sure. So I, want, I think I want to start with thank you notes and then I okay. want to get into tipping. So let's talk okay. about thank you notes because what counts as a thank you note these days? If I, if I meet you in person for an interview, let's say, or you invite me out to lunch or I have you to my house for dinner, mm -hmm. is a text message okay? Do I have to do a handwritten note? Is an email okay? Is a phone call? What counts as a thank you note? First of all, all thank yous count as thank yous and gratitude, but only a handwritten thank you note counts as a handwritten thank you note. Whether or not that is the only good way, I think is really debatable because there are some times where speed might be of the issue. Let's go back to that job interview. I might, you, you know, it might be a really tight process where a mailed letter, while it would be very nice, won't get to them in time for it to make the impact you want it to have on potentially getting the job. And so that's where email is probably going to be your best friend. If you and I are good buddies and we hang out regularly, I think a text message after a dinner party that was a great dinner party is an excellent way to go. And there are some really fun apps out there that if you, maybe it was a special dinner party, so I wanna dress that text message up a little bit. There are apps like High Note out there that will allow you to do that. They're kind of like digital stationary apps. Um, and I think that's fine among friends. When I start to get into relationships where either the relationship is more formal or where it's a newer relationship in my life, that's where I'm going to start to lean on the tradition of that actual note. And for a first time dinner at someone's house, boy, a handwritten note as a thank you might make a really nice impression, you know? So it's not necessarily that you can only do one type or only one type of thank you is the most important. It's about thinking about the time, the place, the person, the occasion, and whether or not this method plus the note itself and the words in it make the most sense and honor the moment the most. I think that's the big thing to recognize. Yeah, I think you're right. I mean, thank you. I mean, I think of like weddings, bar mitzvahs, you know, the bigger events. If people give you a gift, you got to write a handwritten note like that. Oh, yes. A hundred percent. I totally, especially if you haven't been able to open a gift in front of somebody, I think then it's really important to handwrite that note. And th there is one thing that I find really funny about notes and that's it. Like if, if you need something done quickly, the text message is great, but the thank you note, the handwritten note itself gets a longer permission, I guess, because you've got like, like, okay, so like I celebrate Christmas. And so if by January I have it, like I'm fine. If by like end of January, I'm sending out my thank you notes. Nobody thinks, nobody blinks an eye at that. They're like, oh yeah, a couple weeks after Christmas. And then it takes a couple weeks to figure it out, get an address, put a stamp on it, get in the mail. Makes sense. 
But if I sent a text message for a Christmas gift at the end of January, I think that would come across as a little rude, like a little like not appropriate. So it cracks me up sometimes the way the perception of it can vary depending on the timing and things like that. Well, there's also something about a handwritten note. You know, when you do receive that, it feels very thoughtful. And there's a little bit more appreciation that goes into a handwritten note. I okay, so let's too. go to tipping because okay. you say that it's your most requested topic. This year, 2022, and now going into 2023, as I have a tipping interview lined up tomorrow, um, it has really been our most requested topic this year, which surprised me because tipping has been around for forever. And we've been talking about it but for, for forever. But this year in particular, people seemed really out of sorts with it. They were frustrated by um, tipping screens being presented to them in situations they're not familiar with it in. So like um, at the the gas station or at the, you know, uh, retail store, clothing retail store, Um, places where they're not used to seeing it, they're being prompted with it and they don't know what to do or they feel guilty hitting no tip. And then we also see inflated tip screens where we're being asked to tip 50% for a taxi. And it's like, that's just outrageously high tipping. I mean, it's beyond what you should be doing. And so I think what we're dealing with right now is this little nexus of technology providing opportunity, but familiarity and tradition not aligning up with that opportunity all the time. And people get confused. And I think a lot of people also feel like stores and outlets are trying to take advantage of them. And that guilt moment, that moment where, oh, someone's suggesting that I tip. If I don't tip, am I going to look like a jerk? And that is like, you know, it's, it's a thing. It's a feeling that you can really have. And when you would go to the clothing store and buy a sweater and there's no tip jar and there's no tip screen, you don't feel any guilt for not tipping. But when well, you go to- that, it doesn't it changes the whole dynamic of what gets tipped and what doesn't. I mean, it's a larger, exactly. it's a larger conversation, right? Like it's, we're all yes. used to tipping in a restaurant, we're all used to tipping a yep. cab, we're used to tipping our, our hairdresser or our yeah. nail. Certain things get tips yep. that, you know, generally, but I yep. agree with you. Now we're going into places. Also, I think of like fast, casual restaurants, right? That seems mm-hmm. to be a big problem with people and tipping. So yep. it's not fast food. So I'm not, you know, it's on a McDonald's counter. Um, right. So I'm not just up there and they're giving it to me, but it, let's use Panera as an example, because sure. I think that's odd. But, you know, you go up, you place your order, but you sit down and you put a number on there. So somebody mm-hmm. brings it over. So what's like cafe the, service, yeah. Right. So it's like cafe-ish. Like what are we yeah. tipping? And I think some people that causes a lot of agita, right? Because they're like, what am I supposed is that twenty percent? Like, is that what I'm yeah. supposed to be doing? That's a the the exact type of restaurant you just described where you place an order but someone does bring it to your table. Mm-hmm. I think is a really hard one. Some of some people try to ride that line of, well, are they bussing the table or are they just dropping off the food? And if it's like, and so yeah. the, the, the type of restaurant you just described is the type of place where you would naturally get a lot of questions about what I should do. And I think if you work in that type of place, I would be expecting for that to be awkward. I worked in that type of place and we were paid above minimum wage. I mean, not not much. And at the time I was like 14 years old. So it wasn't, it was like 750 or something like that. But it was, um, but we were always working hard for those tips, but the tips weren't supposed to be supplementing our income. They weren't supposed to be a part of that. It was extra on top. Um, and so it's really hard for the consumer to know what to do because you don't know how the people behind the counter are being paid. Are they being paid in at that federal restaurant wage or are they being paid at a minimum wage? And there's supposed to be a really big difference between those two experiences. Well, and I'll add to that. I mean, um, you know, with the pandemic, I mean, that's a whole show for us to talk about etiquette and pandemic. Oh, yeah. where we are. Whole I mean, other I can't, show. <laughs> I can't even dig into that. Um, but, you know, because of the pandemic, there is a lot of restaurants, better service restaurants, fine dining restaurants that have QR codes, right? Oh, so yeah. the um, 
You don't have a menu. You use your QR code. You can order on the QR code. You can pay on the QR code. Um, mm -hmm. It's again, causing some sort of agita when it comes to tipping and what people are supposed to do. I mean, listen, I'm a firm believer in 20% no matter what. Like, that's just who I am. <laughs> totally. what I do. But I hear from lots of people, lots of questions about yeah. what they're supposed to do and making them feel comfortable. Yeah, I think that we still it, it can feel really different because we've just come out of this whole pandemic and we're all getting back to dining out and things like that. But the rules didn't necessarily change. What what changed was during the pandemic, we tried to make an effort to give as much as we could to the people who were still working and, and providing service during this I mean, global crisis. Right. That global crisis is in a very different place at this at this point in time. And a lot of places are functioning fairly fully, even if it's still on uh, staff, like limited and reduced staff. Sure. Um, but I think that the the places where we tip, for instance, we often say for takeaway that you would tip a couple of dollars or maybe up to 10 percent. Um, mm -hmm. that's still very true. Sit down service. We still say 15% minimum. The majority of Americans tip 20%, which I think is awesome. And mm -hmm. if service is even better, you can tip more. If service is worse, do not tip less than that 15%. Your Great. mouth speaks volumes, whereas your money doesn't. <laughs> I know that sounds crazy, but it's, it's true. If you have a problem with anything that went on during your restaurant experience, Talk to a manager. Do not use your money to speak for you. That is the best thing I, I can I love that. Say. I'm going to steal yeah. that. I think oh, that's- Oh, do really use it. Spread it far and wide, Mickey, please. It's, you know, I hate when people complain to me afterwards about their dining experience. Or actually, I mean, listen, we're both watching the news. We both see what's happening. People behave badly on airplanes. People behave badly yeah. in restaurants. People behave badly in a store. Like the, the uh, notion- that the person making minimum wage has any control over what's happening is ridiculous. So, I, you know, I always say to people, like, take your kindness pills when you go out there. Like, nobody yeah. wants you to have a bad time. Nobody wants you to have a bad experience. But I do, you know, there's, it's tough out there. You know that. Like, there's a yeah. lot of rancor out there. So, you know, how are you, how are you giving people help with, like, Yesterday, the FAA, like the whole airline system shut down nationally, right? Yeah. I mean, people are out of their minds and they should be. It is very frustrating. But how yeah. do you help those people? How do you help how do you help people who are frustrated and they need to In the moment, Oh, it's so hard because um, they've done studies. Stress actually leads to more rudeness, which leads to more stress. It's like this like little vicious cycle that just continues uh -huh. itself once it gets going. And I think that one of the best things, and this is probably more uh, 14 years of therapy <laughs> than, than etiquette advice, okay. but I think that for most of us, um, recognizing what you can and can't control, especially when you're stuck in a travel situation, is a really big deal. Um, there are, there, you know, we would all love for travel to be the kind of seamless experience that we imagine from movies and things like that in bygone eras. It just isn't. It's a Byzantine system with a lot, like there, there are so many pins holding this thing together. And as soon as one gets pulled, the chain reaction for how many other are impacted is huge. And so I think taking one minute to humble yourself for the system you're about to enter and try to participate in is a really important big step. Beyond that, um, some people are facing true emergencies, whether it's because they don't have enough of the medication that they would need, whether it's because there are children at home waiting for them or loved ones waiting for them who need care. Um, there's a lot of reasons for a travel hiccup to be something that really does make you frazzled and really does put you in a space where you're not operating at your normal self. And I think being a little realistic about that, as well as being realistic about the system you're traveling within, both things can, I think can help in that moment. Um, I would say that deep breaths are one of the biggest things that I think can make a difference recognizing that you are going to catch more flies with honey than vinegar, shouting, yelling, 
forcing people to do things. Um, it, it feels really good in the moment. A lot of the time it feels like you are getting that frustration out of you and maybe into a useful space. You're not, you're making everyone else's experience way less pleasant when you could have said the exact same things and gotten the exact same results without yelling, screaming and turning purple. And so I think that's, it's like really hard for us to imagine because we're so frustrated in the moment, but it is very, very true that you really do catch more flies with honey. And the more that you can recognize that the person on the other end might not be able to help, I think the more you're prepared for the disappointment if they can't. I think that's great advice. I, I, you said it a little bit ago, you know, don't go in for what you want. It, we want travel to be a certain way, but it isn't. Yeah. And we all know it isn't, and it sucks that it isn't, but <laughs> stop going in thinking that that's the way it's going to be. All right, yeah. last thing we're gonna discuss, and okay. we'll have to, we're coming on Foodie and the Beast, we'll hit some other things okay. then. So I personally am against um, a dress code. I don't think restaurants should have dress codes. I think there is cultural problems with that, um, and it can be, it can, it can really, screw with people in ways that are unkind. Um, so I'm against them. Okay. Having said that, yeah. <laughs> having said that I am against them, <laughs> I do believe that people, so I don't like, for example, there was a restaurant here. They, they did not say do not wear sneakers or flip flops, but when people come in, you know, most people are dressed up at this yeah. restaurant, but yeah. you know, there are really expensive sneakers and expensive flip flops that people there are, are. <laughs> like, flip-flops exist and uh you know gucci sneakers go for twelve hundred dollars so you know the thing is is that i how do we how does etiquette work when it comes to dressing appropriately and in whose eyes is appropriate <laughs> it's right? in the eye of the beholder <laughs> right yeah. um it this is one that's really um it's, it's tough because I, I, like you, I don't love the idea of dress codes. And yet when I see a formal space and someone not dressed appropriate, appropriately, it, it, yeah. it's noticeable. It's like, it's really noticeable. And I think most of us do want to, to some degree, feel like we, we fit in, that we match the event that we're going towards, that we aren't sticking out like a sore thumb. And that in and of itself is a little bit of conformity. <laughs> like, you know, you kind of can't have that without that idea. And so I, I think the best thing that we can do um, is to prepare ourselves and recognize that there just are some spaces where there is a dress code and to accept that that's a part of our lives right now. Um, I, it's really hard. I, I do think each private, private like restaurant gets to decide for themselves. And at the same time, I would want them all to try to be as inclusive as possible. Um, Again, Go it's ahead. about kindness. Right. No, I'm with you. I, I don't agree with the restaurant's choices on yeah. this one, this, that particular instance. Yeah. Um, you know, it used to be you needed a jacket and tie at certain restaurants, yeah. and those things are long gone. Um, yeah. And, you know, but I remember when I went to school in Boston, if we went... I don't know what we were thinking, but we would go to, like, the bar at the Ritz-Carlton. Like, yeah, like yeah. Like, and, you know, none of the guys had jackets on and they would give them jackets and we would go sit at the bar. I mean, actually, yeah. that's what's really interesting about it. Yeah. We all went. We were not dressed. I mean, the girls all look good. But, like, you know, the boys were not dressed appropriately. They gave yeah. them jackets. They did not make them feel uncomfortable about I not like that. coming undressed. And I think that's kind of the piece that's missing, right? Yes. I think you're right. I think you, you mentioned it at the start. Kindness is the piece that's missing. I don't care how ritzy you are, how many Michelin stars you have, or who has dined at your restaurant. If you're rude to, in dismissing a customer, I think that you have failed massively. Like you, you have failed on an epic level and you shouldn't be doing your job. Like, because I think we, we go back to that idea of hosting and hospitality. If you're in the hospitality industry, hospitality is at the heart of this industry you can't say yeah, there's no like, you know that. i know yeah. it's, it's it's so um it's a gray line it's you know it's it's got shades of gray really to act, Alyssa, I, oh but we'll put you this way i'll close on yes. this please when etiquette is used for elitism 
when it's used as a way to judge others and separate people and be exclusive, it's effectively useless and it looks really nasty and gross. But when etiquette is used for self-reflection, for trying to put people at ease, when it's used for awareness of others, it is a powerful and amazing tool for building communities and for treating each other well. And so I just, that's the difference right there. The person who dismisses the person in those flip flops or makes them feel bad about it, no go, you're not being polite, even if you're in the fanciest place. The person putting the jacket on and saying, please come dine with us. Now, you know, we've matched up now um, is is really the person that I think is winning at life. I agree. I love that. That's a perfect way to wrap up. Um, Lizzie, Lizzie Post, great, great granddaughter of the Emily Post. Um, do me a favor. Tell everybody where we can find this amazing book, Emily's Post Etiquette, the centennial edition, uh, and where we can find you online so we can stay in touch with you. So emilypost.com is our website where we have tons of articles. All of our services are available. You can catch up on our podcast. And of course, you can find our book. You can get signed copies through a link on our website. You will see that on every single page of the website. So if you are looking for a signed copy, please, please uh, come to us at emilypost.com. And if you're not interested in a signed copy, which we totally understand, you can find our book everywhere books are sold. Excellent. Thank you so much. I do want to tell people that if you are going to somebody's house as a guest, it does make a beautiful housewarming gift. Oh, thank you. I love that idea. I I love that idea. And so I I told you this, I think when we were together, one of the gifts I like to give to people when I bring something to their house, or if I give people a gift, I always say your gift, my gift to you is no thank you note to me. (laughs) I love it. I love that. (laughs) Thank you note. Um, Anyway, Thank you so much for joining me today, Lizzie. I'm just going to quickly wrap up the show. So thank you also for joining me, Nikki Nellis, here on Industry Night. I think uh, Lizzie and I put it very clearly. You need to be kind out there and you need to be considerate, whether you have people in your home or you're going out to a restaurant or to a hotel or even going to see a, a movie or a show. Wherever you are, it's a lot of stress out there. And it's really up to you as the individual to take care of yourself and emit kindness so that people can respond in kind. And if they don't, just walk away. That's the only thing I can say to you. Um, So a couple great things. Restaurant week is gonna be happening. Get your reservations in. Uh, Amazing, amazing events are coming up throughout January and March. Check out the list, areyouwanna.com. I am eating and doing some traveling. I'm eating around town, but of course I'm eating around the country as well. So follow me at N-Y-C-C-I-N-E-L-L-I-S on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. And uh, be safe out there. Thanks for joining me today and have a delicious week. Produced by HeartCast Media.